So in the end, it actually is very beautiful and does work out for most people. As the you know mental health provider, my job is to make sure all those things are sussed out before so that someone can have a beautiful journey. Welcome to The Surrogacy Scoop, a podcast brought to you by Patriot Conceptions, where we demystify the world of surrogacy from the clinical, family, and surrogate perspective. I'm your host, CJ, and today I'm joined by Rachel Goldberg, licensed marriage and family therapist based in Los Angeles, certified in perinatal mental health, specializing in eating disorders and infertility with a focus on third-party reproduction. She conducts donor evaluations, gestational carrier evaluations, intended parent consultations, and facilitates joint meetings. Rachel also runs infertility support groups and is a regular contributor to various media outlets. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thank you for having me. I want to jump right in today, learn more about the mental health and emotional aspect of surrogacy. But first, let's learn a bit about you. Tell us about your journey, about yourself, and how you got introduced into this career path. Yeah, so I was um, going to school to be Become a therapist. And at the same time, I was a personal trainer and I worked, um, I had a certification to work um, specifically with uh, pregnant or postpartum women on top of my regular uh, personal trainer certification. So I was often around people who were either going through infertility or pregnant and just kind of working with them. And anyone who's ever had a personal trainer knows you get very intimate with your personal trainer. And so I would hear everything. And I had one client who went through pregnancy and I trained her throughout the whole pregnancy. And then it was, she had an emergency C-section. It was, she had to end up taking her uterus out. It was really traumatic and, and hard. Um, and her and her husband wanted more kids. So they ended up using a gestational carrier. And I learned so much about that process. I knew nothing about it. And interestingly enough, I was I'm in Los Angeles and I was also working in West Hollywood, which happens to be very LGBTQ friendly. And so then once you kind of, you know, know that this world exists, it's like now it started popping up everywhere. And so I would just now like talk to friends about, oh, yeah, I, I you know, known someone who's used one. And then people would ask me questions and then their friend would say, oh, can she ask you questions? And as I'm doing all this, like just on the side, like learning about it and friends, I'm also becoming a therapist. And so there was just always this background interest in it. And so then as I became a therapist, I started like working again in the same field with infertility, postpartum, pregnancy. And then that kind of just led to me also being in this realm of gestational carriers or donors or whatnot. So that's how I got into it. That's really interesting. I feel like there is so much personal connection in the surrogacy world. So everybody who I've spoken to, it's always like a friend or their mom or someone that was personally involved with them is how they got involved. And I just find that so interesting, especially considering how personalized and unique of an experience each like surrogacy pregnancy is. Yeah, I think the reason for that is because it's really not, there's so little known about it. I mean, it's becoming a little bit more mainstream because you saw celebrities doing it. And so then there's a little bit more focus on it, but it's, it used to be almost like taboo and there's so much misinformation that it's just like this whole other area that unless you know someone or have been involved in some way, it's just not on your radar. Completely. Exactly. And the celebrity piece is so big too, because that's how Almost every person I've talked to who is not directly involved, they've known about it from a celebrity and celebrity advocates. And that seems to be still such a new and niche part of the industry. But it is nice that there's at least some positive representation and that it's yeah. becoming more of a common thing that people are talking about. Absolutely. Because I think also it's becoming more common just given the fact that more people in the LGBTQ community are using it as well as people are starting to have children later in life. And because of that, they often need third party reproduction to utilize those services. Right. Exactly. So let's dive a little bit into your work. Let's talk about maybe what are some maybe broad stroke at first, challenges that you find commonly that surrogates are facing or come up in your conversations often? Sure. And by the way, if I use surrogate or gestational carrier, it's typically the same meaning. Uh, 
for anyone who doesn't know, traditional surrogate is someone who also use their own eggs, whereas a gestational carrier is someone who's using an embryo. So it's not their genetic material. Uh, but I will probably use the term interchangeably to mean someone who's probably getting an embryo because that's mostly what people are doing. So the things that I see typically is unpreparedness. I think people don't generally understand how involved and how time consuming and how difficult this is. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to be great at it, but there's just, it just kind of creeps up more and more stuff. So they have this idea, oh, I had a friend who was a gestational carrier and it was just a lovely experience or I saw it on the news or, you know, that kind of thing. And it just seems like such a great idea. And then as they go through the process, they realize there's huge screening involved. There is a lot of emotional turmoil. There's a lot of waiting. And also their pregnancies might have been amazing, but it doesn't mean their pregnancy with someone else's embryo is going to be amazing. And also, if you've never been through infertility, you're not necessarily prepared for all the types of things that you have to go through, all the screenings, all the vaginal ultrasounds, all the blood tests, the shots that you have to take to prepare your body or once you're pregnant. So I think there's just a little bit of a surprise element that comes into it. It's not just as easy as, oh, I'm just going to get pregnant. And then I'm just going to have like a really easy pregnancy where I only saw the doctor every once in a while. Whereas now you're going to probably see the doctor a lot more often. There's a lot more checking in. Someone else is also on the other end of this wanting to know what's going on at all times. I think people are just less understanding of how involved it really is. And so I think that comes up sometimes. I would also say what is surprising to people sometimes is when they first start, they think, oh, yeah, I'm going to give up the baby. It's not my baby. It's so easy, right? It's not my genetics. But you do build a connection to the baby in your womb. And so, you know, maybe it's not yours, but it doesn't mean you're not going to have feelings about it. And then on top of that, about 80% of women have baby blues, which is a period of time within the first two weeks after birth where your hormones are just very intense. And it leads to a lot of crying. And so I think people confuse that too as feeling very sad that the baby's now gone. Whereas really it's just this period of intense feelings. And I think what's really important and part of what we screen for um, when we are screening gestational carriers is what is their support system like? It's very important that they have a very intense and heightened support system at their hands at all times during the pregnancy and after. Um, Postpartum depression happens sometimes. I think what happens when you are a gestational carrier, you're getting so much attention that you typically don't get. You know, that these are all people who have children. You cannot, you can't be one unless you've already had your own children. And so often they're they're busy mothers, they're wives, they're taking care of a lot of things, they might work. And it's so often in our society that moms are just kind of like forgotten. Nobody's really checking in with them. Oh, how's your kids? You know, like how are, how's work? How's this? Who's checking in with you? But when you become a gestational carrier, your intended parents are checking in with you a lot and you have so much attention. Are you okay? What do you need? Can I do anything for you? you? You're being doted on. It's great. And then all of a sudden that's missing. So it's not just this grieving over, okay, well now I'm not taking a baby home because sometimes that's great, right? You know, you don't have to do the diaper changes. You don't have to do the middle of the night wake ups. But it's also this grieving of, I had someone literally checking in on me or two people checking in me all the time. And that is now gone. And I feel this intense void in my life. So I think that is something also that comes up. And then lastly, I think the, the other thing that comes up is um, just managing the relationships during and after having maybe a mismatch if you didn't you know, properly match with an agency or whatnot, or just even changes, right? So there's disappointment in maybe how the communication goes, it could either be from the perspective, oh, I didn't realize the IPs, um, which stands for intended parents, were going to be so involved and ask me so many questions and, you know, almost be overbearing. Or there is, I didn't realize they were going to be so distant. I thought they'd be really involved. But again, this no fault of anyone necessarily could just be their personality. And it could just be also that Intended parents are often really afraid. They're really anxious. They're really scared. And for them, just keeping distance because it feels safer because they've already had so much disappointment and grief. So I think those, I would say, are the main things that gestational carriers are surprised by or not prepared for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When 
let me think maybe let's dig a little bit deeper into that last point you brought up. What are some of the differences in the emotional experience from the surrogate and the intended parents? So for the sur- surrogate, it's like all about altruism and excitement and, you know, getting ready. They, they've had great pregnancies, so they're just like ready to give and they're excited about the process. And then for the intended parents, there's a lot of hope, but very cautious hope, fear, anticipation, worried about how the gestational carrier is going to be, the communication style they're going to have. Are they going to feel safe with this gestational carrier? Somebody else is carrying their baby. Worry about miscarriage. Worry about if it's going to take. Worry about, it. oh, I only have two embryos. And what if they both don't work? There's just so much more anxiety involved. They have been through so much at this, to this, at this point already, whereas gestational carrier coming in is just like, yeah, let's go. This is great. Like, we're going to make this happen. I know because I've had four kids and all my pregnancies have been amazing. Whereas for someone who's already, you know, lost, maybe had some miscarriages, lost embryos, like transfers didn't go well, have had many IVF cycles. This is not the same situation for them. There's a lot of fear going in it for them. Yeah, absolutely. And from a care perspective, how does that change how you or the other practitioners at your office handle those situations from both the surrogate and intended parent side? When you're doing an evaluation on gestational care, the first step is to just really make sure that they understand the process. I think people think of the psychological evaluation as a pass or fail kind of thing where we're, you know, gatekeepers and deciding if they are good to go or not good to go, which yes, maybe there is some element to that, but it's not really what we're really trying to do is make sure that this is going to be right for them. Make sure they understand the process. So there's a lot of education involved and make sure that they are really in a place in their life, that this is going to be right for them and enhance their life and not make things worse in their life or cause unnecessary stress. So that's the first part. And then the same thing with the intended parents, um, most clinics or agencies will off, you will like ask them to do a consultation with a psychologist therapist. And during that consultation, there's a lot of education, a lot of talking about different scenarios and how they're going to handle it and what they want and what kind of relationship they want with the gestational carrier. And so that already takes a lot of the angst out and allows them to kind of process what it's going to be like, which is very helpful then moving forward. And then sometimes they will all meet together. So it'll be the gestational carrier, her partner, if she has one, and then the attendant parents. And it will just kind of be a session where you can iron out all of these things. So instead of having this awkward conversation, possibly of, oh, I thought we were going to do this, or I thought you were going to eat this, or it can be ironed out before it even starts by the therapist asking the hard questions for you. So I think that's the best way to navigate it. And there are times when during the process, you'll get a call and they'll say, look, things are not going well communication wise, can you meet with them all or meet with, you know, one and the agency does that too as well. But if it gets a little bit more in depth where there's like emotions and all those kind of variables where there might be a therapist that needs to be involved because of the mental health aspect, then that's where we would step in and try to navigate it as well. Yeah, it, you know, I think Maybe there's a misconception of how many people are really behind the scenes making this work and how many just hands have to be involved. You're working with agencies and then you're working with a bunch of individuals, very high emotional stakes. How, I guess, how do you help people cope with those intense emotions, either from either side of it? I think really just validating where, you know, and, mm. and education again, I think if people are set up with what to expect and how much is going to be involved, then they are going in well prepared or can even make the decision that, hey, maybe this isn't for me. Making sure again, they have a support system is really helpful. But I think especially for IPs, it's really a lot of validating what they've been through, where they're at. You know, many times you'll see a Um, intended mother who has a lot of shame or guilt or self-blame because she's not caring. And that's a hard process to go through. And so just really validating, allowing her to process those feelings, you know, talking about what it's like, and then developing coping strategies for when there are maybe anxious times. So maybe down the line, maybe she had a miscarriage at 10 weeks. And so now leading up to the 10 weeks with her gestational carrier is really scary. So talking about that, talking about how she's going to cope with that time, what kind of communication she feels safe with, 
kind of, again, it's all about preparation. If you're prepared, if you know what it's going to look like, if you know the things that can happen, it really takes so much of the angst and the fear and the emotion out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Preparedness, education, those are seem to be really big through lines throughout, especially your practice as well. What are some maybe surprising or could be surprising psychological effects that come up? Yeah. So from the intended parent side, I think what happens is often they're just going, going, going. Okay, this is the next step. This is the next step. This is the next step. And then all of a sudden there's a void of next steps because now they have a gestational carrier that's pregnant and there's not much for them to do anymore. And so that becomes very difficult because now some feelings come up about it that maybe they had pushed aside for a long time. Feelings about, again, not maybe they can't carry or feelings about, is this the right step? Or fears of, is the gestational carrier taking care of herself really well? So I think it all of a sudden things just really slow down and some fear sets in and wow, like this is actually happening. And so I think on that side of it, it's about just being surprised at how emotional it could be once there's a void and you're not doing, doing, doing. For the gestational carriers, I think there's this balance of them trying to not get attached. Like it's this feeling that they shouldn't get attached. They shouldn't have certain feelings about it, but then they do. And so it's kind of confusing. So I've had, you know, and also for, for a gestational carrier, one of the hardest things that I see happens is they're not prepared for failed transfers or miscarriages or even a stillbirth, right? They've had really good pregnancies or they wouldn't be a gestational carrier and things come up. They might see, oh, wow, there's a low birth rate in, for this one, or it didn't take, or again, like all those kind of situations that you have to do these shots, like all these things that they didn't have to do in their own pregnancy can be very surprising and having to deal with those emotions. So there's times when I have to work with someone who maybe is a gestational carrier who had a miscarriage or a stillbirth. And I think that's shocking and surprising. And they often will feel, they, they will use the word, I feel ridiculous or that I shouldn't have these feelings because it wasn't mine. But of course you do. Of course you have these feelings. You were trying to do something very kind and help another family. And there was an attachment to you, to this baby, just even if it wasn't your genetics and you were trying to detach yourself, of course there was an attachment. And now you have to feel that you maybe let the IPs down, even if it has nothing to do with you, which of course in, in this situation, it really doesn't. It's not that you failed them. It's just, it didn't work. And so there's this self-blame aspect. And then there's this feeling of ridiculousness, like, why am I, you know, so distraught over this? And then there's this feelings of, am I ever going to get a chance to do this again? Or is this going to be my last attempt? And now this is how it ended and it's tainted for me. So I think just having to deal with all the setbacks is, is really difficult for a gestational carrier when it just didn't feel like that was ever going to happen. You never think it's going to happen to you. Right. And that selflessness to the act of service, it, if, yeah, I completely understand that. It would feel like a personal failure if something you're trying to do for somebody else doesn't end up working. And I, yeah, completely imagine how that would be. And there's this also this element too of people know, like, especially if it's a little, you know, maybe you didn't tell people if it was 10 weeks or 12 weeks. Once, you know, a certain time comes around, you, family, friends, people know you're doing this and they're probably praising you for it and saying, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, I can't believe you're doing this. And then to all of a sudden it not be there anymore. Now it's, you have to like explain yourself. And then again, they feel this, they feel this torn feelings of they're so sad, but they, they are afraid to tell people because people might look at them like they have three heads. Cause like, why are you sad? Like it's not, you know, yours, but of course they're so sad. And I think they almost feel like they don't have a right to be as sad as they are. And they absolutely have that right to be extremely sad because this is crushing. They had so many expectations. They went through so much to get to that place. And then for it not to work, it's really scary and it's really hard and it's a dark and isolating place. Yeah, very much so. And especially socially, it's you're reliving the grief over and over again every time it comes up. Um, 
Yeah, I totally see that. When you, maybe I'm a little curious about your practice specifically, is there like a plan that the gestational carriers or the intended parents follow, or is that kind of custom based on the It's custom and it's also based on how, what the um, clinic or the agency wants. So some clinics and agencies want you, you know, everyone gets the evaluation. I mean, unless it's, uh, everyone gets an evaluation or they should, if they're not, if someone is not getting an evaluation or being told they need an evaluation in terms of the gestational carrier, not the IP necessarily, there's red flags there. So all gestational carriers should be screened, should have a psychological evaluation. And it's two components. It's a actual personality test and then an interview. And during the interview, if they have a partner, the partner needs to be there as well um, because they need to be on board. So I think some, so all of them really require that. And then some places, the majority, I would say, require a consultation for the intended parents. And then some, I wouldn't, I would say maybe 50%, maybe even less require a joint meeting for everyone. So it really depends on what's required. For the most part, most IPs don't say we want extra. So they don't say like, oh, well, okay, I know I'm supposed to do the consultation. I know I'm supposed to pay for the evaluation, but I don't need the joint meeting because at the end of the day, they want to save money. And it's totally understandable because they are spending a fortune on this. And if they can save any money and feel like if the the joint session is not really necessary because we, we kind of ironed a lot of that out in the contract, then they might want to skip that. So it's really dependent. And then there are some who will on their own say, I'd like a joint meeting because I have a hard time being confrontational and I'm having an issue with something. And I would like you to help me bring it up and kind of iron things out. So that's something that, you know, I could play a role in, or again, sometimes a gestational carrier will have in her contract that she can have mental health benefits, maybe a therapy session every trimester to kind of do a check-in. And if it's agreed upon that she might need more, then that can mean the contract that, okay, yes, she's, you know, allowed to have more sessions. Also, sometimes they are allowed to have some postpartum. So I maybe work with someone after just to kind of check in again, see where they're at, see, because again, it's isolating. It's, there's very few people who have done this. So it's not as if they could turn to their friends easily and say, this is what I'm feeling. Now they may be able to turn to Facebook groups or other people that the agency put them in touch with, or, you know, a random someone that they met who has also been a chastenal carrier, but it's not necessarily the same where you can really just air out how you're feeling to someone who understands the process because this is what they do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, I'm a little curious as well about what are some of the challenges that come up or what are some things that you look for when you are working with or interviewing potentially the partners of gestational carriers? Okay. So one, that they're on board. You want to make sure there's no like coercion. So mm. the partner wants them to do it because maybe finances are low. So you, you want to check in with that. You want to make sure that they're stable. There's no drug abuse, that they are able to take care of things. If some, you know, there's bed rest involved or she needs help with dishes or child care. So you want to make sure one that he's on board or the partner's on board if it's a same sex couple. And you want to make sure that they feel that they can help support throughout this process. And you want to make sure they feel comfortable also with having some type of relationship with the intended parents. It would be very hard to completely cut off from that. And also just kind of talking about how do you feel if with the intended parents being in the same room during delivery or the ultrasound or just kind of wanting to know where they stand in this. But really the most important thing is, are they supporting their wife doing this or their partner doing this? Or are they not supporting it? Because if they're kind of wishy-washy or I don't really feel comfortable with her doing it, but she's going to do what she wants to do. That's not, a, it's not a great scenario because it's going to cause conflict within the marriage or the partnership. And the last thing we want to do with this kind of situation is cause conflict for the gestational carrier. So again, part of the role of the evaluation is not just, oh, are you going to be a great gestational carrier? It's, is this going to be fitting for your life? And is this going to enhance your life? Or is this going to make things more stressful in your life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you look, when you're trying to understand the support system, what are some 
guidelines maybe or just what kind of support are you looking for? So you want to make sure that there's someone available to help if she needs to go to the hospital or if something, there's an emergency and she, she's a mother. So she might have small kids at home. And if dad is always like gone, you know, for work three months out of the year, does she have somebody else that can step in? Does she have a mom or a sister who can, yeah, come, I need you to come watch the kids or I need the kids to spend the night. Also, sometimes these arrangements are, you know, not in the same state or in the same vicinity. So you might have to travel and you want to make sure that they're, that so the home can be taken care of if she cannot do it. So that's one thing. You also want to make sure that they are not financially in a bad place. People should go into this where they are already financially stable. Doesn't mean that the, that the pay that they get for it isn't helpful to them. For the majority of people, it is very helpful for their life, but you don't want them to be in a place of debt or they need this money kind of thing. Um, And you also, so you want to make sure to find, you know, whatever support system looks like there's finances involved. So if it's the partner that he has a job and whatnot, you want to make sure that there's people she feels comfortable talking to. So if she does have feelings, especially postpartum, because again, what's going to happen postpartum is you're just right away stripped away from all the care you were getting, right? It's not about you anymore. The IPs, they're so grateful and they're so happy, but also now they have an infant to take care of. And so they might check in with you, but it's not going to be the same kind of checking in. And so there's this kind of lull. And so you want to make sure that they have people around them that can pick them up, that can help them, that can be there for them postpartum during that couple of weeks, or if it's longer where they might need to rest. Um, you want to make sure that they have someone who can maybe drive them somewhere if needed uh, last minute. So it's kind of just making sure there's people around to help and that it's not a single mother who doesn't have a lot of resources doing this, where if she has to now drop everything to go to the hospital, it's going to be much more challenging because he is scrambling to find a babysitter and whatnot. Right. I A piece of this that is really sticking out to me is how many non-obvious insights there are with the so, you know, support system with the partner, with the intended parents. I understand why the screening and mental health piece of this is such a big part of the surrogacy industry and why so many agencies require it. Because it's, it really seems like there's so many things that even if you've prepared and done everything you can, you're going to be surprised along the way. Yeah, I think one of the, the most common things that happens after a, a consultation with an intended parent is, or the intended parents, they... I think they come in thinking like, I don't need this. I know everything. I read everything on Facebook or whatever. And then they're at the end, I always get, I'm so glad we did this. Just there's things that I can help bring up that maybe they didn't think about or, you know, that they might want help navigating. And so I think for that reason, yeah, it's just interesting because there really is so much that goes into this and it's, it's hard to know. And with the screenings too, it's very important to screen because there could be something in someone's past that maybe didn't get flagged in their medical records or whatnot that you need to assess for, you know, what, what is the arrangement between maybe they come in and they're like, yeah, my, my partner and I were together and everything's fine. And then you meet them together. I'm talking about maybe the gestational carrier and and their, their partner, and you see conflict in the middle of the session. And you're like, wait a minute, that, that's not what the paper said. You know, that's not what you guys wrote down. So things, things come out sometimes that need to be addressed. Yeah. And especially too, with how individualized the surrogacy industry's care is, I imagine there's really only so much you can cover at a single doctor's visit or even in a single screening. Absolutely. There's definitely things that we cannot cover everything. There's definitely still surprises that come out of it for people. I mean, you can be as prepared as you want to go into it and still your journey is going to somehow come up with something that you didn't expect. I think one thing a lot of people don't expect too is how long it takes. It takes a really long time. Like, you know, you think, oh my God, I found my perfect match. Here we go. And it's like, you have to now go through the psychological screenings. You have to go through all the contracting. You have to now make sure your body's prepared. And then sometimes maybe they'll find a cyst or something that has to be removed first, or your lining wasn't great. And so they have to postpone it. There's just so many things that keep coming up often. And it just feels like, wow, who knew that it was going to be take this long. Yeah. And maybe kind of expanding a little bit on those 
maybe particularly challenging case, could you maybe share of a case that you worked on that had some unexpected challenges and how you navigated those complexities? Yeah, so there was one that I had not too long ago where everything was going great and it had been announced at this point because it had been maybe 16 weeks, she was pregnant, there was no red flags, nothing. And then she went in and there, it was kind of, the, there was movement that was a little bit not as she, as active, but they were like, okay, well, it's 16 weeks, not such a big deal. Let's just go home. You know, there's still a heartbeat, whatnot. And then she herself felt like something was wrong as time went on. And she would call the doctors and she would say, I, I don't, I just, something doesn't feel right. And they're like, it's fine. This isn't the same as your pregnancy. Maybe you felt more movement at 18 weeks because at this point things had progressed, but it's still early. It's hang in there. If you're not getting, you know, any kind of symptoms like bleeding or like massive headaches or anything, it's fine. And it turns out she was right. And so it ended up being that there was no heartbeat the next time she went in and it was devastating for everyone. And the IPs weren't there when it happened. And so then they came to the hospital and nobody knew how to navigate that kind of situation because it, nobody knew what to do in that grieving situation. Do you, do the IPs take care of the surrogate? Do, does the surrogate take care of the IPs? Everything just felt so fast and so hard. And it was kind of like the situation where she did what she needed to do at the hospital and and they kind of were informed about it at the hospital. And then they just kind of parted ways in, in a way of like, okay, well, bye. And, you know, she's not going to obviously be a gestational carrier for them again. And so there was a lot of grief on both sides of like, there was no closure at all. And so what I ended up doing, because both, both the IPs and the gestational carrier wanted to reach out to the other, but didn't know if it was appropriate. And so I kind of stepped in when the agency reached out to me and I actually brought them together and was like, let's talk about this. This was really hard. This was grief. Like, what do you want to say to each other? And just kind of navigate that because it felt very lonely for each, you know, the gestational carrier felt like she disappointed them and why weren't they talking to her? And the IPs were like, I want to respect her privacy. I know this is probably hard for her too. And also we're grieving. So yeah, I, I think that was really, that was a tough one because it was just a lot of tears and emotions and not knowing how to navigate next steps. But I think just being able to like say last words and have a little closure, I think was very helpful for everyone. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think those kind of harder, tougher cases are rarely what you hear about. I mean, even if we kind of go back to what we were talking about earlier, this is still so new in a lot of people's mind. And so you are so much less familiar with the best case scenario, let alone the worst case scenario. So I imagine that those challenges are just, you know, so unique yeah. to navigate each time. The other challenges that happen that is is not as serious, but definitely happen and is common, common, not not super common, but it happens more than you would like is just navigating the relationship during the pregnancy and then right after. So Everyone might say, yeah, I'm super open. I'd like to talk a lot. And then lives get in the way, right? So the gestational carrier might have be juggling her job and three kids and not have time for the Zoom meeting every three days that she said she was going to be able to do. And so then the IPs get upset and also they don't want to bother her because they want to keep the relationship amicable. And there's that. And then sometimes you'll hear a gestational carrier who just feels like they're being very overbearing. Like they didn't mention anything about you know, wanting to make sure I eat this or eat that, but all of a sudden now it's a concern. Or they saw me on Facebook out with friends and they're concerned that I had a glass of wine because my friend's glass of wine was in front of me, but it wasn't mine, you know? And so it can get a little touch and go right there. And so you have to kind of just navigate that. And I think there's a lot of expectations that should be ironed out as best as possible in the beginning to know that these things might come up. And when they do, how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to approach the gestational carrier IP? Are you going to go through your agency, which is definitely the better way to go? But how are you going to navigate these relationships really when an issue comes up? Because it is very common that an issue will come up. It might be small, but there is communication mishaps and it's okay that those happen. How are you going to navigate them and cope with them as opposed to maybe just, I'm just going to ignore it or I'm just going to, call them out on it kind of thing. 
Yeah, it is interesting how much interpersonal relationships, you know, obviously they pop up in every single aspect of life, but especially here, because uh, yeah, you could have everything smoothed out and something pops up and you never could have anticipated it or something that's so normal to someone that they don't even feel the need to bring it up later turns into something that somebody else maybe has questions about or wants to dive deeper into. Yeah, so much interpersonal connection. I find that so And one thing too is is that you want to talk about also in the pre-pregnancy stage and the matching stage is what kind of relationship do you want after? Is this a relationship where I'm going to send you pictures once a month or on Christmas? Is this a relationship where we're going to get to see each other? Is this a relationship where we're just going to like no contact, we're done? Because a child might one day think, I, I kind of want to know who carried me. And is this something that's going to be an option? So I think just knowing what kind of relationship each party wants is also important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe this is a, a good spot as we kind of wrap up here. Is there any final thoughts that you have from your perspective as a therapist in this field that you might want to share with people who are interested or maybe kind of on the side interested in this world, either personally or for somebody in their life? Yeah, I think what I'm going to say is we talked a lot about some of the negative things that come up, but I also want to make sure people understand that this really is a beautiful process. And at the end of the day, it usually works really well. And the gestational carrier has this intense feeling that they gave someone a family and it feels really good. And then they want to jump in and do the next one because it felt so good. And the intended parents are so grateful. So I think there's this idea that maybe the intended parents are going to feel jealousy towards them or the gestational carrier is going to feel that they want more interaction with the child after the child's born. And so there's this fear of like, how is this going to be? But really at the end of the day, it's beautiful experience for everyone involved. And oftentimes there is a relationship after, cause you do get close to each other. I mean, think about it. You're together sometimes in the most happy moments ever, you know, the birth or just even hearing the heartbeat, right? You guys are together in very emotionally charged, intense times and that brings a bonding. So in the end, it actually is very beautiful and does work out for most people. So I don't want to make this so negative because I'm bringing up all the things, but as the mental health provider, my job is to make sure all those things are sussed out before so that someone can have a beautiful journey. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Rachel. If anybody wants to learn more about you or your practice, website, email. Yeah. My website is great rachelgoldbergtherapy.com and you can find me on instagram as well at rachelgoldbergtherapy it's kind of a newer instagram so i don't have a ton of followers yet but that that's me and yeah you can find any information you want to reach me at through my website so and i'm happy, happy to answer any questions anyone has great well thank you so much for your time today thank you everyone for listening and we hope to see you on the next episode Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Surrogacy Scoop, and I hope you found value in this meaningful conversation. For all resources mentioned in the episode or to connect with Patriot Conceptions online, visit the description. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast hosting platform and share this episode with those in your life who may be interested in getting involved. 